Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last one was my seminar in US side. Today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Morley Tao to give this week's one one mind seminar. Dr. Tao received his PhD degree in computational mathematics from Caltech in 2011. He is currently an associate professor of mathematics at Georgia Tech. Before that, he was a current instructor with, uni uh, with New York University. He has received several awards. For instance, he was the recipient of 2018 NSF Career Award, uh, ACE Desk 2020 Best Paper Award, Cool and Pack Scholar Award, and the GT Emory Joint AI Community Award. His research interests are pretty broad. For example, uh, he is now focused on the understanding deep learning dynamics inspired learning algorithms, AI machine learning for science, and the scientific computing, numerical analysis, and so on. Today, uh, Dr. Tao will talk about the implicit bias of large learning rates in machine learning. Tao, is your turn. All right. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction. And I, I thank, um, thank all the organizers, especially Long Xiu, uh, for this great opportunity. And uh, I also thank everyone who actually come here, uh, especially given that New Ribs is, is due very soon. So, um, so great to be here. Uh, so like introduced, uh, I work on the mathematical foundations of machine learning. And uh, when it comes to that, people oftentimes think about probability and statistics, uh, which are definitely the founding pillar. Uh, but I, I'd like to think uh, that other areas of mathematics can also play important roles. Uh, for example, dynamical systems, differential equations, uh, geometry, computational math, uh, and it really should be a synergy of everything all together with machine learning uh, that could actually enable interesting research. Uh, so in this talk, I'll be mainly focusing on uh, the applications of dynamical systems, uh, but of course, uh, that'll, that'll be combined with probability and statistics. Um, when it comes to the interaction between machine learning and nonlinear dynamics, uh, there are actually uh, a very uh, active direction, which is to use machine learning to solve dynamical problems. Uh, but I'd like to say that the reverse direction is also very fruitful. So, uh, so you can actually uh, use dynamics to help design and analyze optimization, sampling, and deep learning algorithms. And uh, in this talk, I'll just be focusing on very uh, something that is very specific, namely the analysis of, of some deep learning practices. So, uh, so there are other things that we work on. So we work on optimization, we work on sampling, uh, we work on generative modeling, uh, and also scientific machine learning. So, uh, so hopefully, um, I can actually talk to you offline about this if you're interested. Uh, but, uh, but for now, let me focus on the analysis of deep learning practices. And in fact, even that is pretty broad. Uh, so the very specific thing that I'll, that I'll be focusing on is based on a common belief, which is large learning rate is good. So, um, so if you are a mathematician, you may ask, what is the learning rate? Uh, it's the same as step size. So for example, so if you're trying to minimize a function, a differentiable function f, uh, very often in machine learning, people like to use things uh, that are uh, based on gradient descent whose iteration is simply given by this, this update rule. And this h is the step size, but, but it's also called the learning rate in machine learning. So uh, if you're a computational mathematician, you can easily see that this is like a forward Euler time discretization of the gradient flow ODE. And uh, of course, you, you know the gradient flow ODE will converge to a local minimizer of f, so you would hope that uh, you, if you iterate this gradient descent for a very long time, uh, then you would approximate you would approximate a local minimizer of f, hence achieving minimization. So if you do that to a fixed continuous time capital T, you would need t over h steps, and uh, and therefore naturally you think, okay, so if h is large, then you use less steps. This is computationally more more efficient. Uh, there is a problem. So the problem is if h is very big. Uh, your numerical solution, your, your iteration actually no longer approximates the, the continuous solution. So in fact, um, 
you know, the benefit of large learning rate is, is not just to make the optimization faster, you actually get something extra. So these are called implicit biases in my definition. Uh, you actually get implicit bias toward desirable global structures. Uh, of course, you should say this is too vague. What, what do you exactly mean? So very roughly speaking, you, you get properties that actually lead to better training and better test accuracies. So, um, so just to, to fix my terminology, so let me review a paradigm of supervised machine learning. So uh, in supervised machine learning, you have basically two phases. You have a training phase where uh, you are basically given training data, which consists of like data pairs, uh, data pairs. So, so each data pair is, uh, is a pair of input and output. And then you pick a model, for example, um, a neural network, which is parameterized by X. And then you try to use this neural network to predict the output label of your, of your data point. And then you try to make that match the actual output label. Uh, and then of course, then the task of training becomes a minimization problem. So you look for the best parameterization such that the match is, uh, the, the matching is as, as good as possible. Um, but of course, if you if you choose a very expressive model, uh, say a, a, a deep neural network, for instance, uh, then G is highly convex. The the total function f, this objective function, is highly highly non-convex, and, and oftentimes your minimization can get trapped. Uh, in, in, at, at a local minimizer. And that's not good because uh, that means that uh, you actually have suboptimal training accuracy. You know, there is a global minimizer that, uh, that can actually give you a much better match, but you just couldn't get it. Uh, so in part one, I will, I'll try to illustrate that if you use a large learning rate, you can actually escape local minimizers. And in fact, I, I will show you can do that in a very quantitative way, uh, which promotes basically uh, better training accuracy. And uh, and then there is a second phase. Uh, the second phase is uh, is the testing phase. So after you have done the first part, you get X trained, and then you use that to make further predictions. So now your tested data comes. Uh, the tested data oftentimes only has the input label, and then you try to use your trained model to predict the output label. But of course, you can think like theoretically, there is some secret underlying output label, and you hope that your prediction matches the, the, the latent output label as much as possible. So, uh, so if you think about this, uh, the test error is not exactly the same as the training error uh, necessarily. And uh, the, the, the gap between them is sort of like uh, called the generalization uh, of your model. So, uh, so for example, so even if you are actually at a global minimizer of the training, uh, training loss, uh, you may not have zero test loss. And in fact, your F may actually have multiple global minimizers as well, and they can all give very different test, test accuracies. So, uh, so therefore you actually really care about generalization. You care about the one, uh, the, the one that you converge to, uh, whether it generalizes well. So, uh, so this is something that uh, part two and part three of this talk will, will roughly touch upon. So. Uh, so again, the idea is to say, the, the, the claim is to say uh, that if your learning rate is large, then you can actually get improved generalization uh, in some sense. Okay, so uh, so that's the big picture. So let me let me be concrete and start uh, with the first part. So this is a joint work with my with my student Lin Kai Kong, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's published a while ago in a top machine learning conference. So you can find it online. Uh, the goal is very simple. Again, the minimization of a simple function uh, with, we consider gradient descent. If the learning rate is very small, uh, then you see that uh, this particle uh, indicating the location of uh, the iterate uh, in this potential well will converge to a local minimizer in a very simple way. If H becomes big, on the other hand, you still get convergence. Uh, but the, the trajectory of the X iterates is actually oscillatory. Uh, now, if I further crank up H, uh, I can get instability. My, my iteration will just not converge and blow up. Uh, what if the simple the test uh, potential well is just a, a very small part, a microscopic part of a multi-scale potential? So here I again run a uh, gradient descent with a large learning rate where particle indicates uh, actually the uh, 
along the x-axis, the value of my iterate, uh, you can see that the particle is actually bouncing around. Uh, it's very difficult to predict where the particle will go in the next step. And uh, that's indeed the case. So here I'm plotting the value of x uh, as a function of the number of iterations. So you can see this, uh, this uh, like very noisy-ish trajectory. Uh, which almost reminds you like a, a of a stochastic process. Although I want to I want to emphasize that gradient descent dynamics is completely deterministic. Uh, but you can also collect, um, for example, values of x uh, that uh, that is um, that x takes along this trajectory, and then plot the histogram, and then you get some shape. This shape almost looks like some some simple statistical distribution, and. Uh, and, if, and that's uh, that's why I actually uh, say that the deterministic dynamics of gradient descent in this case actually exhibits quotation mark stochastic behavior that is very similar to SGD. I mean, if you are familiar with stochastic, stochastic gradient descent, uh, you will typically see trajectories uh, that is like this and also histogram of values that is like this. Um, so what is going on? Because I mean, uh, our gradient descent is completely deterministic, deterministic, but it nevertheless exhibits stochastic behavior. Uh, we do have a rigorous theory. So the theory says if your objective function is multi-scale and uh, your learning rate is large, then the, the dynamics of gradient descent is actually going to be chaotic, and that's why you see stochastic behaviors. Uh, so what do I mean by multi-scale objective function? So uh, I mean that the objective function can be written as a superposition of a macroscopic potential. For example, it can it can look like this, and then plus a microscopic one, which is uh, which is indexed by a small parameter epsilon, which indicates basically the small scale. Uh, one instance is that I can take a periodic function, I can squeeze it in the x direction, I can squeeze it in the y direction, and then I, I add this periodic function to the macroscopic potential, and then I get this multi-scale potential. Uh, of course, you can you can say, oh, this is uh, this is uh, fine if you're a mathematician, but in practice, how can you ever get such a like a regular structure? Uh, it doesn't have to be so. So, for instance, uh, you can have uh, what, what dynamics call um, quasi-periodic microstructure. So you can have multiple frequencies and then the microstructure looks much more um, realistic. Uh, but in fact, we don't need that either. So our assumptions are actually pretty mild. Uh, roughly speaking, we just need the micro potential to have a gradient uh, to, that, uh, that is order one. And also, uh, I, I require that the second order derivative of the micro potential to be order one over epsilon. I mean, you can easily check that that's the case for these two examples. So that's a that's a that's a generalization to to a weaker situation. And uh, so that's multi-scale objective. What about large learning rate? So um, remember, we are just doing this iteration, uh, which can be spelled out like this, and. Uh, uh, in, in order to explain what is a large learning rate, let me first explain what is a small learning rate. So, uh, so in optimization, it's known that uh, if your learning rate is smaller than one over uh, one over Lipschitz constant of the gradient of the entire gradient, and then uh, you are guaranteed to converge. So this translates to the fact that uh, we if if eta the learning rate is smaller than epsilon, then you have guaranteed convergence. Uh, physically, this means that uh, your your step size is so small that you actually resolve uh, the small scale, and therefore you you have guaranteed convergence. But it's a boring convergence because you will just converge to a nearby local minimizer. Uh, on the other hand, if your learning rate is super big, uh, then you can't even resolve the large scale, and the iteration, even without the stiff uh, small scale potential, will be still unstable, um, and then you just blow up. Uh, so you get instability on the right, and then you get convergence to, to a boring local minimizer on the left, but there, there is a lot of space in between. And this is the interesting situation, which I call the large linear rate regime. So in fact, uh, uh, if you look very precisely, there will be actually uh, two regimes. So as eta keeps on increasing, first you will enter something that I call a local chaos regime. And then as eta further increases, the chaos will transition into a global behavior. So let me briefly explain that. Uh, first, uh, let's talk about the local chaos regime. So we are iterating this map. 
Uh, so you can you can think really like like a discrete dynamical system uh, that is being understood. So uh, so if you look at the neighborhood of a local minimizer, uh, so the state space is basically the the y axis. The x axis is the value of eta. So for each eta, uh, you can consider like the dynamics. So if eta is very small, then the uh, then the min local minimizer is actually a fixed point of this dynamics, and it's actually a stable fixed point, meaning that if you start your initial condition, for example, right here, and then you iterate, you will actually converge eventually to this fixed point. Uh, but as eta keeps on increasing, eventually this fixed point will lose its stability, and instead you have these two branches actually emerging that corresponds to something called the periodic orbit, meaning that if you start right here, you iterate once, you will actually jump to here, and then you iterate twice, you will jump back. Moreover, this is actually an, uh, an attractor. So, uh, so if you start uh, elsewhere, you will eventually converge to this period two periodic orbit. As eta further increases, the period becomes four and then eight. Uh, so this is something well known called period doubling bifurcation. Very quickly, the period becomes infinity and the system actually transitions into chaos. Um, I, I'd like to mention that at this moment, uh, everything stays inside the microscopic potential well. So these two dashed lines are the boundaries of this potential well. And uh, in this situation, this dynamics can be well understood by using some theory called unimodal map, um, but it's, uh, it's a bit boring. Uh, but, uh, but the more interesting thing happens when your learning rate keeps on increasing. I mean, you can sort of already see that. So the boundary of this chaotic uh, attractor keeps on increasing. So eventually it'll flood over this potential well. Uh, that's easy to understand. So suppose you are right here, your gradient is pointing to the right. If you take a large step size uh, of large enough step, of course you would just jump over. You will just go to a, a position that is outside the potential well. So this is where the fun begins. Um, so this is actually the global chaos regime. Uh, re regime. So as eta further increases, we can actually prove that uh, the gradient descent iterations no longer converge to a point, but rather it actually converge weakly to a statistical distribution that is uh, nearly Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. So, um, so the proof is actually pretty complicated. So I will not I will not say too much about it. Uh, but but I, I'd like to actually discuss the implication. So if you stare at this expression, what shows up in here is actually f zero. So that's the macroscopic part of the potential. So for example, in this demo, uh, the actual loss may look like this. Okay, so macroscopic potential polluted by local potential uh, by microscopic ones, uh, which create uh, all those potential well. Um, but uh, this macroscopic potential is just this, this simple clean one. And uh, the limiting distribution actually only depends on the mo mac uh, macroscopic one. So uh, so this result is interesting because, okay, so some people may, may, may say, okay, uh, first of all, gradient descent cannot really um, uh, overcome like um, non-convexity. Uh, and, and then they will say, oh, maybe, maybe you're, may, maybe uh, this is trivial. Uh, so if you H is, sorry, if, if eta is very large, it's like driving a car very fast, and then you don't even see those those small bumps on the street, and then you will just converge to a global minimizer. Uh, but that's also incorrect because if you follow this result, uh, you will actually be sampling uh, according to this potential f zero. So what that means is that. Uh, for example, so if you start your initial conditions uh, uh, like, like as an ensemble, like, like uh, this uniform distribution, and then you run this, you run this gradient that, that descent dynamics uh, for a very long time, and then your um, long time solution actually becomes distributed according to this red curve. So you will not converge to just this single point, but in fact, you will be sampling all, all possible points just with different probabilities. Um, this is good because this is actually a, a mechanism to escape from all these local minimizers. And uh, typically in machine learning, people, people think, okay, you can escape local minimizers if you have stochastic gradient. So you use noise to escape local minimizers. But now this is a completely uh, complementary alternative uh, mechanism. So you escape local minimizer via large learning rate. This is purely deterministic. There, there's no noise. 
And uh, um, if you pay the like close attention to what I previously wrote, uh, so the previous theorem was assuming actually f to be f zero to be strongly convex, but we also have theory for non-convex f naught. Uh, that's that's pretty complicated, so I will skip that. Um, but instead, I I want to say uh, something that is more urgent. Uh, for example, so do we really have multi-scale landscape for real problems? Uh, the answer is yes, both empirically and theoretically. So for, for example, so here I'm training some neural network, on uh, some actual data set. Uh, there is a lot of information contained, but let's just focus on, for example, this one. So this is plotting uh, the trajectory of one of the parameters uh, that is that is being trained as an as a function of the number of iterations. So if you really get convergence to a point, then you would just get a, a very thin line. But that's not the case. You actually converge to a blob. So this is basically like the support of the marginal distribution of this parameter um, of this uh, of, of the the limiting distribution. And same thing here. So other parameters have histograms. Uh, which is not a direct peak, but uh, but actually some complicated shape. You even have non-convexity, et cetera. And also you can you can show this theoretically in limited setups. So the idea is that, okay, so if very often your, your training data is multi-scale because, uh, because you basically have fluctuation around some mean. And, uh, and the, because of that, you may actually inherit multi-scale structure in the loss function. But this is not trivial because your loss function is actually a function of the parameter of the, of the say the weights of the neural network, not a function of the data. The data is already given to you, it's fixed and you optimize over the parameters. However, uh, for example, if you have a two layer neural network and a periodic activation, you can sort of prove a duality so your uh, parameter sort of inherits the multi-scale from the data, and then your loss also gets the multi-scale structure. So that's why uh, you know you really have a such a situation in practice. Uh, so let me summarize part one. So uh, so deterministic gradient descent can actually escape small-scale local minima if your learning rate is large. Uh, that's because then your dynamics becomes chaotic. And then the iterations will actually be sampling from a statistical distribution rather than optimizing the loss. And this implicit bias matters because um, because this is basically saying, okay, so you actually uh, can can go to different points with different probabilities, but uh, but deeper minimizers have um, have exponentially bigger probabilities to to be converged to, uh, well to to be actually in encountered, and this actually gives you better training accuracy. Uh, of course, you can say, okay, so that's good because good training accuracy gives you good test accuracy, but that's that's not really like a, a result about test accuracy. Uh, now moving on, I want to emphasize more on on the test accuracy aspect, uh, or more precisely, the generate uh, the generalization aspect. Uh, to be fair, um, maybe I should give a little bit of background. So, uh, so it's a it's a very popular belief that uh, flat minimizers actually generalizes better. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a statement that is too general. It's actually not true in certain situations. And, uh, and, and, and the other situations, you can even prove that. Uh, I'm not gonna, gonna get into this argument of, of talking about whether flatter minimizer generalizes better. But uh, what I want to say is something that is completely rigorous, which is that if you use a larger linear rate, then you can actually get get a minimizer that is flatter. Um, so this this story starts with this paper, this joint paper with my student uh, Yu Qing Wang, former student collaborator Ming Shuo Chen. He is advisor to Zhao, uh, and uh, the first paper is this uh, uh, clear paper, which you can also find online because it's just a, another top machine learning conference paper. Um, we were motivated by understanding two-layer uh, neural network with ReLU activation uh, and L2 error, uh, but, but the, the loss actually doesn't matter too much. Uh, the, the most important thing is this activation function. So ReLU is a highly nonlinear activation function, but it, it actually enjoys an amazing property, which is that, okay, so if you multiply the input by a scalar C, the output also gets multiplied by the same scalar C. And because of that, uh, this uh, this model, this uh, 
training objective function actually enjoys a symmetry, which is if you multiply the first weight matrix by a scalar C and divide the second weight matrix by a scalar C, then you get exactly the same loss value. And this symmetry is amazing. For example, it, uh, it, it says that, okay, so you actually have a continuous set of minimizers. You give me a minimizer, I can pick a C arbitrarily close to one and create a, a, another minimizer nearby. Uh, but actually some of those minimizers are sharp, some of them are flat. And the question is, uh, if you train this, if you optimize this F using gradient descent, for example, which one of the minimizers will you get? Um, so in fact, uh, there, is, there is an empirical belief uh, that if you use gradient descent and a large learning rate, you will converge to flat minimizer. Uh, there, are, there are actually some seminal theoretical results. Uh, for example, um, uh, it was known that if gradient descent with a large learning rate actually converges, and then it does converge to a flat minimizer. Um, but uh, in this work with, with Yu Qing and collaborators, uh, we actually sort of removes this if clause. Uh, our result is basically saying, okay, gradient descent just converges if your learning rate is large enough. Uh, and actually it has to be larger than what is allowed by traditional optimization theory. So, so it's no longer like if it converges, then we get flatness. Uh, we really just get convergences uh, and, and therefore flatness. Uh, of course, you know, this is a completely rigorous proof so we can only do it for class of problems. Um, and then you of course would ask, okay, so, uh, so is it too simple to talk about deep learning if you just deal with two layers? Uh, in some sense, yes, but that's uh, uh, that's in some sense also the status of uh, current theoretical investigation, and that's why we are here. Uh, if if you are in this seminar series, series, uh, you you probably have seen a lot of uh, similar similar investigations. Uh, so in fact, uh, I'm gonna even simplify the model. I'll actually consider a two-layer linear neural network. I'll just uh, uh, consider like an identity activation function. And uh, even this model is non-trivial, so there are a lot of uh, exciting research about it. And uh, But if you still don't like it, uh, you can also think about something that is almost exactly the same. Uh, it's a matrix low rank factorization problem. So there you are given an N by N matrix. You are trying to find a rank D approximation of this rank uh, of this, this A matrix. And uh, you can do that by by formulating the problem as an optimization problem, you're basically using an n by d dimensional matrix X and n by d dimensional matrix Y to create this product, which is also rank D uh, to approximate this, this matrix A. And uh, I'm gonna take this example as, as my illustration uh, as my following illustration, uh, because it actually has a lot of interesting properties. Uh, so for example, so it has, infinitely many minimizers, but uh, every local minimum is a global minimum. Uh, but among them, some of them actually have balanced norms. So, so their norms, uh, their, their X and Y norms are similar. Uh, and you can prove uh, that uh, these minimizers actually are, are, are relatively flat uh, if you sort of uh, local, locally uh, linearize the, uh, the well, use a quadratic approximation of the potential. Um, but uh, not all of them are flat. And now flat ones create trouble. So you can actually write down the gradient descent iterations very easily. And uh, uh, if you have unbalanced ones, then you have a lot of difficulties. For example, so let's say if X has a small norm, Y has a big norm, then this quantity is big, this quantity is small. Uh, so naively you would think, okay, so you have to use small h such that this part does not blow up, this part does not change too fast, but then you make very little progress in the other part. Uh, so I can be m much more analytical in, in, this, in this claim, but, uh, but basically unbalanced x and y are, are bad. Um, uh, you feel like you, you are forced to use small h, but that's actually not true. So in this work, uh, we actually can prove that if you use very large learning rate, then it does not matter uh, whether you have balancedness. So eventually, uh, if your H is large enough, you will have convergence and also X and Y will get balanced. 
Okay, uh, so to illustrate this, uh, this, this, um, this interesting phenomenon, let's just uh, like do a visualization. So it doesn't have to be one D, two uh, D, uh, but I'm just plotting like uh, the situation where X and Y are scalars, and then I can plot uh, everything in in two D plane. So these two curves are basically the curve uh, of uh, the global minimizers. Uh, corresponding to basically x times y equals to one. And if I start my initial condition right here, uh, if I run gradient descent with small learning rate, I'll just converge to a nearby local minimizer. So that's boring. But if I use a large learning rate, like 0.5, I will first jump here and then jump here, 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 and eventually I do some oscillation and eventually I converge to a point where x and y are both almost like one. So you actually converge to a very far apart minimizer that is balanced, even if your initial condition is already close to this curve. Um, so this, this happens if your learning rate is large, how large? So uh, approximately, it's like uh, no greater than four over L. And if you're familiar with convex optimization, uh, traditional theory says that, uh, well, even non-convex optimization, traditional theory says that, okay, so if your H is what is less, less than one over L or two over L, then you have guaranteed convergence. Otherwise, you're not sure about the convergence, but here you have four over L. Uh, moreover, uh, if you are really an expert, you should, you should be unhappy about what I said, because this loss function is actually a fourth order polynomial. So the gradient is actually a cubic polynomial. You don't even have global Lipschitz. So you don't even have this L here. Uh, so, so indeed, global theory requires global Lipschitz constant, but here we only require local Lipschitz constant. So our theory is even stronger. And also, like I said, even the convergence is non-trivial under such a large uh, learning rate, uh, let alone the implicit bias of balancing. But we can do it. And also we can, we can do it really in multi-dimension. So for example, so in matrix factorization, uh, you know, I'm just showing you some result where I keep on uh, increasing my learning rate from the right to the left. Okay, so if my learning rate is small, uh, then X and Y sort of converge with, with their norms not changed by much. Uh, but as learning rate becomes bigger and bigger as I go to the left, the discrepancy between these two norms actually becomes smaller. So they become much more balanced. But of course, there's a limit. If you go beyond uh, a limit, such as the 4 over L that I previously talked about, uh, you get instability. Um, the proof is complicated. I'm not going to say anything about it. Uh, you just have to discretize the, uh, well, sorry, you have to scrutinize the discrete dynamics. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it just now, but uh, uh, but later on, I'll, I'll, I'll say more intuitions. Uh, but this is basically part two. So uh, large learning rate uh, can actually implicit bias toward balanced uh, global minima, and uh, that actually pr provably corresponds to flatter minima as well. Uh, so this is this is how you can get you can get this uh, implicit bias of balancing uh, between say um, uh, matrix weight matrices of neural network. Uh, but of course there are there are other implicit biases of large learning rates that people have been studying. For example, there's a uh, there's some notion that is pretty popular called edge of stability. There is also some other notion called uh, loss catapulting. Uh, what about these? Can you actually prove something? Because I mean, it, there, there are a lot of existing empirical results. So this is this is what I'm going to talk in the, in the next part. Uh, again, joint work with Yu Qing, Zheng Hao, uh, who is uh, uh, like a student that I co-advised and also his advisor, Tuo Zhao. Um, so, in order to describe uh, the, the full story here, let me start with the stability result, uh, which I briefly mentioned earlier. So prior to our work, uh, we had this stability result, which says, okay, so if gradient descent can actually converge, then the fixed point it converges to must have its local geometry satisfying some condition. So this condition is that, okay, so if you look at the largest eigenvalue of the Haitian of the loss function, it's bounded by two over H. And uh, this, of course, is a characterization of the sharpness of the local geometry. So smaller, largest eigenvalue gives you sharp, uh, flatter local, local geometry. And uh, the proof of this is very simple. You just use simple stability uh, result from dynamical system. Uh, 
Okay, so I can just do it in one minute. So you consider iterations of the gradient descent map. This is this is creating some dynamics. Uh, you linearize it at the fixed point. Uh, the linearization corresponds to this coefficient matrix. And uh, if your fixed point is stable, then a necessary condition is that all the eigenvalues of this uh, this matrix has to be in between negative one and one. Uh, if that's not the case, then you have some uh, unstable manifold, which means that you have some escape direction. Uh, escape direction is bad. That just means that uh, the like in a neighborhood, uh, points that ca can actually converge to the fixed point will be actually of measure zero. So, um, so this is saying, unless you are really, really lucky, you will not converge to this fixed point. Uh, but uh, but if you already have convergence, then it means that uh, this fixed point has to be stable, and then you have boundedness of of all the eigenvalues, which which gives you this condition. Uh, so simple proof, but uh, but very cool implication because this is saying okay, so if your learning rate is larger, then this upper bound is smaller, and then you you are guaranteed to converge to flatter minimizer. Uh, however, again, under a very strong assumption, this is uh, this is under the assumption that if gradient descent still converges, we know that large linear rate can actually destabilize gradient descent. So, uh, so whether you 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 actually satisfy this if clause is non-trivial. Uh, like I said, uh, in certain situations, we can we can prove convergence. So that's uh, that's a much stronger result. Um, I'll come back to that later. But there is one thing that I want to take from this stability result. Okay, so, so stability result only says two over H is an upper bound, but uh, a surprising empirical observation, actually multiple observations is that uh, in many cases, uh, when you converge, your sharpness is actually gonna be approximately just two over H. So, uh, so this is to say gradient descent often stays at the edge of stability. So this, this notion is coined uh, by a, a great paper by, by Cohen and, and collaborators, even though uh, this may not be the first paper that actually studied, uh, observed this, uh, this phenomenon, but they actually gave a rather systematic study. Um, and this is, a, this is a very interesting result because I mean, so if you train a neural network, uh, there are many things, there are many local minimizers you can converge to, but this sort of gives you a control of which one you converge to. For example, so here I'm plotting a simple example. So CFRA 10 trained on two layer, uh, Rilu and Huber, uh, Rilu activation, Huber loss. Uh, so uh, what I'm plotting is uh, like how the sharpness of my current iterate changes with the number of uh, iterations. So you can see, okay, so if H is gonna be this value, then you converge, you converge like the blue line. Uh, you can barely see it, but there is actually a dash line underneath that corresponds to two over H. So that's the auxiliary line. You really converge to there. If you H is a different value, then you converge to a different local minimizer. Okay, so so that's why edge of that's one of the many reasons edge of stability is interesting because it, it sort of uh, um, opens the black box. Uh, however, edge of stability is not always the case. Uh, so I can change my neural network a little bit, and then suddenly I don't have edge of stability anymore. So I still have convergence, but uh, you know these two trainings don't give you sharpness that coincides with the auxiliary lines. Um, so therefore we ask ourselves, what optimization problem actually exhibits edge of stability? And also uh, this is this is a, a implicit bias. Is it related to the balancing implicit bias that I previously talked about? What about other phenomena? Uh, so there is actually by now a, a pretty rich literature on the theoretical aspects of edge of stability. Uh, you know, a, a lot of great, great researchers and contributions. Uh, however, most of them are based on uh, some single specific toy objective function in order to really understand what, what, is, what is happening in edge of stability. Uh, but if I want to understand the question of what optimization problem exhibits edge of stability, I have to basically compare objective functions. And then it's, it no longer suffices to consider a single objective function. So that's why this question remained, remained new. Um, and so was the second question. Uh, and then we thought about it, and then we, we realized that we, we actually asked a pretty stupid question. Uh, so the, the question should really be, 
what makes edge of stability more likely? What do I mean by that? Okay, so if I pick an initial condition that is already a fixed point uh, with uh, sharpness two over h, then I, I, I run the simulation, run the uh, gradient descent. Of course, I get edge of stability. I just stay there at the edge of stability. Uh, so it's, it really should be, uh, do you have a lot of initial conditions that give you edge of stability or, or you only have a few? Uh, so this is why you should actually, we should actually ask a better question. And uh, we have an answer. So the answer is uh, if your objective function has good regularity, uh, and also you have large learning rate, then you can actually have a more likely edge of stability. Um, in order to actually analyze analyze this, uh, we have to, to actually invent some wheels. Uh, so we actually have some global convergence theory for large learning rate gradient descent. So large is new. And also we have to deal with non-convex objective functions. So non-convex is new. And also we, we cannot have Lipschitz gradient, global Lipschitz gradient. Uh, so this is without Lipschitz uh, gradient. Um, by using the theory, we can also answer the other question. So, uh, so it turns out that edge of stability, balancing, and catapult are sort of like the the, the different tips of the same iceberg. So, uh, so they are really just due to the same dynamical phenomena, uh, phenomenon that is underneath. Uh, but uh, but but of course, let me be more concrete. Let, let me first explain uh, what these phenomena are. So uh, here is just a tool example. It's just a for illustration. Uh, so uh, so if you minimize this loss function using a large learning rate, initially your loss actually shoots up and then it gradually decays. Okay, so it's very different from the small learning rate regime where f will be monotone. Uh, so this is this first phase, this you know up shooting phase is, is known as catapult. Um, what about this? Okay, so here I'm plotting basically the difference between x and y, uh, norm squared. So it's like the difference between the the balance. The, uh, the, the this is like the extent of of the balancedness of, between two layers, and you see the balance actually uh, gets better. So the difference actually gets smaller. Uh, so this is uh, this is balancing. Uh, Any addition, edge of stability is like okay. So uh, so if you're so I'm plotting the sharpness of uh, of my iteration. So eventually the sharpness converges to two over h. Uh, so this regime is called the edge of stability regime. So you 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 basically stabilize this around two over h, and also Cohen and collaborators called the previous regime to be progressive sharpening. I think it's a great name. So you your sharpness gradually cross up. Um, what they did not see is actually an additional. Uh, additional stage um, where the sharpness actually drops initially very quickly. So this is a desharpening regime that was later on observed, for example, by Anne and collaborators. And uh, we we claim that uh, this desharpening regime, this desharpening stage is actually the same as the catapult catapult regime, catapult uh, phenomenon. So what is going on? So uh, so I couldn't give a full proof, but I can sketch the idea. So if you think about like a central dogma of gradient descent, so uh, so the classical central dogma is that if your learning rate is small, gradient descent just decreases the loss value. Not true anymore if your learning rate is large. So in in the large learning re regime, uh, gradient descent has to settle in a flatter region. Okay, so so more precisely, we saw the stability result. Uh, so if you really could have convergence, then gradient descent has to settle eventually at a region that is flatter. Uh, so this is a new dogma. And uh, if you can understand both dogmas, um, then you can you can actually sort of understand our our intuition uh, behind uh, like a two phase convergence theory of gradient descent. So you pick a large learning rate uh, initially. Uh, your initial condition uh, is likely to have some local Lipschitz constant uh, that is going to be greater than 2 over h. I mean, if h is very big, uh, l is fixed, and then l will be bigger than 2 over h. So you are actually initially in a relatively sharp region. And gradient descent does not like it. Gradient descent actually seeks a region 
where uh, it's no longer sharp. So it seeks a flat region. And then uh, as you go there, uh, you know, everything's relative in, the, in this uh, non-global Lipschitz situation. So it, as, as you go there, uh, your L becomes smaller and then H is the same, but it's no longer bigger than two over L. And then you are in a relatively flat region and then gradient descent can just converge like in the classical uh, case where the, the learning rate is less than two over L. Okay, so you have these two phases, first flatness seeking and then standard convergence. Okay, to understand this better, so let's take another look at this plot. Okay, so initially you are right here. Uh, here, your loss value is very small, uh, but it's too sharp. So gradient descent doesn't like it. So it has to search around, it, it bounces around, and then you unfortunately have to, to go to bigger loss in order to escape. Uh, but eventually it settles, uh, it settles at a region where it, where things are flat and then H is no longer large in a comparative terms. And then the, the, the loss becomes smaller and smaller. So you see, uh, so so you get catapult because you know gradient descent absolutely has to settle in a flat region. So so you you have to go flat even at the cost of temporarily increasing the loss. Okay, so this is catapult. Uh, so I talked about catapult and its relation to sharpness decay. Uh, so really these two are just the um, uh, manifestations of, um, of the same underlying dynamical phenomena. Uh, you don't always have that because your initialization has to be at a location that is sharp. So in the original Cohen paper, uh, they probably didn't have that sharp initial condition and therefore they didn't see this uh, uh, this uh, de-sharpening stage. Uh, same thing to balancing. So balancing is also correlated to de-sharpening. Uh, I think for the sake of time, let me skip that. Uh, but uh, but really, you know, everything is due to the underlying nonlinear convergence process of, of gradient descent dynamics. Um, okay. So this is sort of like a, a very quick unification of the three phenomena, uh, but but still I haven't answered the question, which is when will edge of stability actually happen? Um, and the high level answer is that, uh, uh, like I said, edge of stability happens for certain initial conditions. Uh, some objective function will actually give you more such initial conditions. And of course you need large learning rate. And uh, in fact, our result is again, completely rigorous, uh, but, but because, because of that, we can only talk about a, uh, a family of objective functions. Within this family, uh, as the regularity of the objective function gets worse and worse, you will have less and less edge of stability initial conditions. More precisely, okay, so we are considering functions uh, so we are considering a property of function, which we call degree of regularity. It's a very simple thing. So it, it just means that uh, uh, the degree of regularity of a function is like the, the lowest degree of a, of a monomial function uh, that can envelope, that can envelope the function uh, at infinity. So, uh, so why are we talking about this? Because uh, this is something that you can compute uh, for activation functions, for for loss functions, and for like normalization techniques, and uh, because the neural network training objective function is like a, a composition of all these things, all, all these nonlinearities, we can e we can talk about uh, the degree of regularity of neural network. So here is an illustration on a toy example. So this is a super toy example, but but for which you can you can do uh, do theory rigorous theory. So just the one data point. Uh, without loss of generality, as, assuming the input and output labels are both one. Uh, three layers. Uh, the first layer is a linear layer. The second layer is a nonlinear layer, uh, just one neuron in the second layer. And the third layer is not trained. So the loss function can be easily written as, okay, so input comes in, gets multiplied by the first layer, gets multiplied by the second layer, you know, no activation because it's a linear linear layer. And then it passes through a, an activation function and then it gets multiplied by the last layer. And then you compare uh, the prediction where is the output label using the loss function. And okay, so this is activation. Maybe you have normalization as well. You can, it can be put here. Uh, you, this is a loss function. Um, 
And this tall example is made up such that I have homogeneity. So I, have, I, can, I can just for simplicity denote the product between these two vectors. And then I have a simple function, which I call capital F. Um, and uh, you can talk about the degree of regularity of this capital F. It's just the degree of regularity of the loss function times the degree of regularity of the activation function. Okay, so the so this is uh, some something that is very concrete, uh, easy to compute, and in fact you can talk about a degree of regularity of different activations and losses, etc. So for example, tangent H has DOR of zero, leaky relu or just relu has DOR of one, uh, mean square error has uh, has DOR of two, but Huber loss has one. Uh, if you use batch normalization, you get you get a zero, etc. Okay, so then. Uh, our theory says, okay, so roughly speaking, if your degree of regularity is less or equal to one, then edge of stability and other implicit biases are more likely. Uh, of course, that was uh, very, very hand wavy. Slightly more precisely, we consider a family of simplified functions. Uh, this function, this family has a property that I have all kinds of regularities, okay, ranging from less or equal to, to one, to uh, all the way to like arbitrarily high degree polynomial. Uh, but I have to sort of compare things in a fair way. So we design this family such that all the minima uh, are global minima and they are located at the same location. And also they have the, sh the same sharpness. Uh, this family in 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 encloses, uh, in in well, incorporates many uh, existing uh, single toy examples uh, st studied in the literature. And then within this family, we can prove if learning rate is large, uh, then as DOR um, is less or equal to one, then many initial conditions gives you edge of stability and other implicit biases. But if, edge, uh, if DOR is greater than one, then uh, in a same set of initial conditions, less of them, increasingly less of them will lead to implicit biases, okay? So, uh, so therefore, uh, if you have good regularity corresponding to small DOR, uh, then you, you are likely to have edge of stability and other things. Uh, bad regularity uh, will be the contrary. Okay, what about real neural network? So beyond the rigorous theory, we have, we have very precise consistency. So here I'm training neural network. You have a lot of pictures, but uh, basically I'm, I'm having six different loss and activation combo. And uh, if you use our theory, uh, you can easily compute the DOR of the training objective. So these three, the, the, the green three are actually the good ones, the good regularity ones, and the red ones are the bad regularity ones. And you can see that you get perfect consistency with the theory. Okay, so you have edge of stability here, here, and here, but you don't have edge of stability when the, when the DOR becomes greater than one. Um, Okay, so that's what I said. Furthermore, um, you can even fix it. So if you want edge of stability, what do you do? You can just add normalization. So here I'm taking C, E, and F. So the previous red ones, I'm just adding batch normalization. So remember batch normalization actually has a DOR of zero. Once you have that, you get a DOR of the objective function that is zero. So in fact, uh, theory predicts that you gain back edge of stability, and that's that's really the situation that we saw in in practice as well. So that's uh, uh that's very good. And um, given the time, I think um, uh, I will not talk about the proof, but just to say, okay, so 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 therefore this uh this is a um, a situation uh where theory actually can give you some implications about the design and training of neural network. Uh, plus, you know, the, the, the mathematics is actually very interesting, at least to us. Um, so, uh, so regarding the proof, so uh, very roughly speaking, um, good regularity gives you uh, some quantity uh, that, uh, that we design as an observable to follow certain property. And then the convergence of gradient descent gives you uh, another property of this quantity. And now you sort of have a competition between the two properties. And then eventually uh, this competition gives you edge of stability and other phenomena. 
Uh, so I think I'd rather stop here and uh, and take questions. So I want to thank my amazing collaborators. Again, Lin Kai Kong is a graduate student at Georgia Tech. Um, Yu Qing is, is also my PhD student. Uh, she's going to Berkeley for postdoc. Uh, Mi Shuo was my student collaborator. Uh, he went to Princeton as a postdoc after Georgia Tech, and, and now he's an assistant professor at Northwestern, uh, and Zheng Hao Xu, who is a, a second year PhD student. Uh, Tuo Zhao is, uh, is my faculty collaborator. Um, so uh, if you want to know more, uh, please feel free to, to, to take a look at my, my blog and, and other social media uh, efforts. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and feedback. Thank you so much, Maury, for your excellent talk. Any questions for the audience?